Um, okay, so today I want to talk about uh, humor and cultural transformation. I want to thank Jacques and Mary in particular. Where's Mary? Yeah, there you are. Uh, for uh, bringing me here and taking good care of me, especially with all the technological stuff today. I really, really appreciate it. This series has had um, a number of remarkable guests, people that I consider to be friends and also uh, inspirations in many ways. So I'm especially honored and, and humbled, actually, to really be following and they're trying to follow in their footsteps here. Um, I honestly wish that I were closer to New York. I wish that all the time, especially when I'm in Cambridge, uh, so that I could participate in this more fully. This seems like an amazing project and an amazing series and an amazing place. And so, come on in. Speaking of amazing, hello. How are hello. you? Nice to see you. Uh, and, uh, and I'd really love to actually take part in something like this more uh, deeply. And so if I ever move back to New York, I will look forward to that day. Uh, but nonetheless, it's great to be here tonight. I want to share with you a kind of funny thing that happened to me on the way to here today. Um, I was on my way to that iPhone store, and uh, I was in a bit of a, a sort of frazzled state, but I sort of was breathing the New York air and being very happy to be back here. And I went by, I was walking along the top of the northern part of Central Park and I ran into one of those carts with the horses. And I always find them really beautiful but too expensive to actually participate in. And so I just went by the horse and I was missing my dog for some reason. For some reason I thought the dog and the horse were kindred spirits. So I said, hey buddy, how are you? And he looked at me and then just unleashed this torrent of urine on the ground uh, which splashed on the moment in history. Uh, maybe, perhaps, Jacques, when you uh, dreamed up this series, it might have seemed a little dreamy, a little out there uh, when you initially conceived of this, but certainly matters in the last several months have made this a topic or these topics uh, immensely relevant to our contemporary day. Uh, revolution is everywhere, all around us. In the Arab Spring and the Wisconsin Uprising and the Occupy Movement, we're surrounded by democratic insurgencies and authoritarian crackdowns abroad and now also very much here at home. It's everywhere. And I'm happy to talk actually about some of those things because I've been very much following them, participating in them, commenting on them, confused by them, excited by them, and so I'm happy to talk about um, any of that in the, in the Q&A. But as much anxiety and as an uncertainty as these kinds of revolutionary moments produce, this is a very exciting time to be alive. And I can't help but think that my students are so overwhelmed by what's happening in the world. These are Harvard students, after all, and their primary sort of focuses and goals in the world is sort of status and security and safety and success, the three, the four S's. I love alliteration, you'll come to know that. Uh, and, but one of the things that has been interesting to me is how many of them have, they're asking questions, they're awake to what's going on around them, they wanna figure out how on earth all this shit that they're studying in the classroom relates to all of this stuff swirling around them. Uh, and they're trying to connect what's happening in the world to their studies and vice versa in a way that I haven't seen actually at Harvard in the 12 years that I've uh, been there. Um, that most of the students for the last 10 years have been um, full of fear and anxiety, uh, which has only, I think, not all of them, except for one of my students who's here. Many of my, I'm talking about my undergrads, uh, and some of my Kennedy School students. But uh, th there, there is a sort of uh, awakening that is happening even slowly there. And I can't help but think about connecting it back to my own kind of awakening politically and personally when I came to college. I mean, I was ra came of age politically and personally during the Reagan era in the midst of the AIDS crisis, in the midst of illegal arms trading and wars abroad and Tiananmen Square and the tanks rolling through Tiananmen Square and the, the Chinese student movement that emerged out of that, which happened literally in the June of 1989 as I was graduating from high school. I entered uh, Harvard as, an, as a freshman and the Cold War was sort of ending and the Berlin Wall was crumbling. The first thing I did before I went to uh, register for classes was to attend an anti-apartheid rally and I became active in that campaign. It was my first really sort of exposure to political activism. And so all of this was swirling around me then as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to study and who I wanted to be, who I was. Uh, and I can't help but think that personally and politically, I can't help but hope that soon enough I will have much more in common with my undergraduates who are now a generation removed from me than I've ever had in common with them before. And I, I think that this is a moment in our history that allows for that. So I'm thrilled that this kind of thing is happening uh, here and I thank you for letting me be here. Uh, as Jacques mentioned, I have spent most of my career uh, studying the American radical tradition, which I do believe is a tradition. Uh, that there is a sort of a, a, a vigorous strain of radicalism that has, that has been a powerful engine for social change in this country that has inspired lots of things outside of it as well. Uh, but there's a thing about radicals. We see often things that other people don't want to see 
or won't see uh, before they see it. We always have, and I hope that we always will. There's an important place for radicals in the world, uh, and radicals come in all different shapes and sizes and stripes and, uh, and sounds, uh, but there is a dear place, an important place, a central place, a crucial place for radicals in our culture. Eugene Debs uh, caught this when he, addressing the jury in his espionage trial in 1918, said this. It's one of my favorite quotes, and I think it encapsulates what I mean by this radical tradition. He says, when great changes occur in history, when great principles are involved, as a rule, the majority are wrong. The minority are usually right. In every age, there have been a few heroic souls who have been in advance of their time, who have been misunderstood, maligned, persecuted, often put to death. Long after their martyrdom, monuments were erected for them and garlands woven for their graves. And I can't help, I'm reminded of this every time I talk about Nelson Mandela as a terrorist and a communist, which is, of course, how I came to know Nelson Mandela in the public and political discourse of my coming of age. And to, to my students, Mandela is perhaps the great hero of our age. And that in and of itself, that one person, is an example of exactly what Debs is talking about, how history can restore people who buck the system, who challenge the system, who try to upend and revolutionize the system. Uh, they become heroes eventually. And I think that one of the things that's interesting about the Occupy movement, one of the things that I find so profoundly inspiring about it, is this kind of invocation or framing of the 99%. Right, that perhaps we are living in an age where the majority, the supermajority, in a different context, may actually be right, may actually prove Debs wrong for the first time in our history, and wouldn't that be just wonderful? Today I want to talk about humor and cultural transformation, and specifically as it relates to the LGBT movement. Um, I've been told I'm a funny guy, or at least funny looking, um, and maybe, maybe that's not true tonight. I'm looking pretty swanky tonight, I think. Uh, but this is not uh, my topic of scholarly expertise, frankly. And I want to be upfront about that. This is something I think about. It's something I sort of do. It's something that's all around me. And I want to offer some sort of reflections or provocations or sketches tonight. Uh, I also should say that at the very beginning, someone asked me, are you funny? <laughs> and people have been asking me that uh, all week about, well, this is going to be funny <laughs> on Thursday because you're not. And I'm usually actually much funnier when I'm not prompted to be funny. So I'm probably not going to be that funny tonight. <laughs> uh, but I want to say that humor is not genetically coded onto some so-called gay gene, as one of my well-meaning colleagues once suggested to me very, very seriously. Um, I want to quote Glenda Carpio's book, her new book, Laughing Fit to Kill. Black humor and the fictions of slavery. And this is a picture of Richard Pryor uh, dressed in almost nothing <laughs> with a crossbow uh, and arrow. In this important book, and I'm going to draw from this to frame some of the things I want to talk about today, she talks about why humor is understudied in the academy, why we don't pay t attention to it as a kind of legitimate thing to study and understand. She said, in academic circles, perhaps the lack of this kind of exploration of humor may be due to the challenges that humor in general presents for scholarly work, which tends for the most part to be woefully devoid of humor, as if to evidence the capacity or interest in laughter would make one appear less intelligent or less seriously committed to one's work. And when I read this uh, in the introduction to her book, um, I came to understand uh, why I've had so many professional troubles over the years. Because I tend to like to inject humor every now and then, as my students and colleagues know. So tonight I want to offer, as I said, some sketches, reflections, some provocations on the political uses of humor and its power and even pitfalls as it relates to cultural transformation. Um, and if you, anyone here doubts that there can be a kind of relationship between humor and politics, the only thing that we have to do is turn on for five minutes anything related to the GOP primary uh, in American politics. <laughs> There's an endless, uh, endless source of great humor, irony, wit, tragedy, comedy, all of these things that are wrapped up in that. Uh, it's a parade of circus freaks that just is really like the herpes of politics. It's just the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, <laughs> I'll draw tonight from my work on American radicalism, from African American culture, media and communications, LGBT politics, and a little bit on the Occupy movement, with which I've been active lately. Throughout, I'll reference my own experiences as a radical gay man, the personal is indeed the political and vice versa, at this profound and also profoundly absurd moment in American history. Let me start with some of the tensions that exist in any conversation on humor. In a world of binaries, in a world that is structured around binaries, and this world is, humor is often seen as the opposite of seriousness. Right? These two things are juxtaposed against one another. This manifests itself in a number of ways. Let me give you a couple of examples. Professionally, 
right? I rarely go to faculty meetings. I hate faculty meetings. There is never a moment, there are never times in my life where I'm more acutely aware of my own mortality than when I'm at a faculty meeting. <laughs> and that is because they are deathly boring. There is not one ounce of humor in there. So I often will say some outrageous things at faculty meetings, which doesn't gain me any friends in the faculty. And one time my dean actually came up to me and said, you know, whenever you come to these things, you're, uh, you never take them seriously. You're always interjecting humor into this. And I said, well, God forbid. I said, well, the only way that I can endure these things is to do that. And he said, well, maybe you shouldn't come. And I saw that as an invitation to stay away, so I've stayed away ever since. Pedagogically, right, this, 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 these kinds of tensions manifest themselves, right? I joke with my students about one every eight to ten minutes, one joke every eight to ten minutes, or a good story every eight to ten minutes, because most of my students are, you know, not, I, I ban laptops in my class, but they still come up with littler devices that I can't see, especially in big lecture halls. Um, so I try to make them laugh or tell a story to engage them in some way so that they'll put the devices away and they'll actually listen and engage not only with me but with one another. I remember when I was in graduate school, Eric Foner, my mentor at Columbia, gave this great lecture on socialism and communism in the United States in his course on the American radical tradition, which actually inspired my first book, the documentary history of the American radical tradition. And afterward, after, in this lecture, he gave this amazing story about how, uh, how Trotsky had come to live with his family when, uh, in the early part of the century. And that Trotsky had been a horrible, horrible house guest. He was terribly messy, uh, <laughs> socks and all sorts of food and things all over the house. And finally, the phoners, grandpa and grandma phoners, finally said, you know what, screw this, you're out of here, we can't do this anymore. Uh, and so he had nowhere to go and went back to Russia, and then shortly thereafter the Russian Revolution began. And, uh, and Foner sort of linked these things, this, this sort of uh, this story about Trotsky having lived with his family and then the beginning of the Russian Revolution. And I uh, met with him right after lecture, and the students loved it. And all of the, they have all these radicals that come to his lecture. It's one of the great things about his lecture courses. The first two or three rows are all these old communists and IWW folks and uh, socialists and, and anarchists and so forth. And once he gets to the 20th century, they start correcting him. No, Eric, that did not happen. It happened on Tuesday of 1918. You get it right, Eric. Um, and so, and, but everyone loved it. The students loved it. The old radicals loved it. It was fab. I loved it. So I said, was that true? And he looked at me devilishly and he said, Tim, never let the truth get in the way of a great lecture. Uh, and then, so there it is. And then, so, but it was, it was a funny joke and it made everybody howl and everybody loves the course and it's one of the things they tell about it. I still don't know if it's true. Personally, right, if we're in a relationship with someone, friends, lovers, whatever, and someone is always cracking jokes, always making a joke, never being serious, we think it's that, that person's sort of hiding something, that there's some, that the humor is sort of covering up some kind of deeper thing that they can't really process and they need a sort of therapist for, and this happens in relationships all the time. And then, of course, politically, this tension emerges because if people see that you're having too much fun, right, if you're enjoying the act of protest, then you can't be that oppressed. Right. If, if you're that oppressed, if you're that oppressed, you're not having that much fun. And so you got to be really angry, really serious, and really in your face uh, to be seriously political. And so politically speaking, humor is really risky for at least two reasons. And the two reasons I'll outline are, are, are these. One is that when we are protesting and we are engaged in acts of revolution or liberation or transformation, we are dealing with serious shit. We're dealing with slavery and segregation. We're dealing with patriarchy and poverty. We're dealing with homophobia and hatred, viciousness and violence, economic inequality, war. These are serious things, right? It's hard to be funny all the time about things that are really serious. And so serious issues require a certain amount of seriousness. And so humor seems like a kind of outlier or something that doesn't quite fit in that kind of political project. And the second reason why humor is politically risky or risky in politics is that for stigmatized people, People whose identities in society are shaped by stigmas that are unreal and untrue and meant to demean and to diminish and to deny, especially racial and sexual minorities. There's always the risk when using humor of playing into stereotypes, of becoming sort of minstrels of a certain kind. And I think that these risks are really important to consider when we make use of humor in political contexts. Let me give you just a couple of quick examples. Richard Pryor, who Glenda Carpio writes about in this book, uh, famously, he had been, many people don't know this or don't realize this, that Pryor had been a very kind of clean-cut comedian until the 60s. 
late 60s and early 70s when he kind of came out and sort of introduced a kind of dark black humor, and that's Carpio's term, uh, to a much more integrated audience. And so he came up with these sort of skits in his comedy routines, particularly in Live and Smokin', which was a, a routine he did in 1971, of the wino and the junkie, where he would embody these kind of archetypes of black people, of black men in particular, as a way to express grievance and grief. But there was also a way that those kind of representations, those self-presentations that Pryor was uh, very provocatively uh, advancing and embodying, uh, were seen as being sort of real representations of black people. Uh, and it, whereas Pryor was trying to get at the kind of grievance and grief about the legacy of slavery and of poverty and so forth for black folks, uh, some audience members, many people sort of interpreted that as his kind of acknowledging or reinforcing or authenticating these kinds of stereotypes. David Chappelle, Chappelle more recently in his show, uh, in 2000, began 2003, it was sold more than any other show in terms of DVDs, 1.7 million DVDs of the first season of the show. It was the best-selling uh, show of its kind up until that point. And he had amazing skits on that show. The one that a lot of people remember is the blind black white supremacist who sort of oh, takes his hood off and every, all of a sudden this guy who's spewing racial hatred uh, is black but he doesn't know it. And that skit actually comes from a book, Black, Bla black No More, uh, a 1931 novel by George Schuyler who was an early kind of uh, 20th century black humorist. Um, but Chappelle ended his show in part in, in what he articulated to Oprah during a very famous interview and in other sources that he was worried after several seasons of the Chappelle show that he was trading in these kinds of racial and gender stereotypes as well and he didn't know that if he could, that he could take his humor to the next level and not do that. In gay culture, we see this all the time. Uh, I, I had a very, very hard time dealing with Will and Grace when it first came out. Uh, I didn't like Will or I didn't like Will or Grace or Jack. I liked Karen. I thought she was the queerest person on the show in many ways, uh, and probably meant to be. But the character of Jack particularly made me upset. I thought that Jack was represented as a kind of gay minstrel, and yet at the same time, I came to through a whole series of conversations with queer friends of mine to see Jack as perhaps something more that he is is effeminate and flamboyant and over the top and itinerant and creative, and he is in many ways far more comfortable in his own skin, in his own identity than Will ever would be or ever was on the show. And so how do you make sense of someone like Jack who may sort of reinforce for some of us certain kinds of gay stereotypes, uh, but yet at the same time provide a kind of subversion uh, that uh, was very important? And I'm, you know, I'm not sure how that, that goes. And I must say that you know, when, when you think about the kind of performance of queer politics, uh, you know, I'm always, as a, as a political person sometimes, um, who has to deal with you know, folks who are not radical a lot of the time, um, I worry about those assless chaps moments after the gay pride parade. I worry about the one media image of the guy in assless chaps who's chained to a young twink in a dog collar. I worry about that. And I worry about why didn't that cameraman or camerawoman just shift the camera just slightly to see two you know, gay folks who have been partnered for a long time with two lovely children and a dog next to them. Why can't they show both of those images and let us decide which of those images makes us more comfortable? But then I think to myself, do I care if they're comfortable? Do I care if I'm comfortable? Aren't both of those images us? And so I think these are, when we think about humor, we think about the performance of different kinds of identities, we have to think about who are we trying to please and who are we trying to liberate? And I must say I implicate myself absolutely in that kind of dilemma. The Occupy movement, I think, suffers from similar or, or, or has to contend with similar kinds of things. I was just at a recent discussion, a, a public discussion about the Occupy movement, where one of the Occupy Boston protesters actually said to me that he was a folk guitarist, uh, among many things that he did in his life, and that he has stopped playing guitar and leading folk sing-alongs at Occupy Boston in a Dewey Square whenever the media is around. That he will not perform artistically the things that are part of his identity because he knows that they're going to be manipulated by the media as a way to construct an image that these people are just, you know, wayward folks, you know, hippies who uh, don't really have any politics. And I loved the moment, conversely, where the, the one of the sort of treasurers of the Occupy Wall Street movement was on, interviewed on CNN after they published their first quarterly report of finances, <laughs> what they had taken in and what they had uh, 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 taken out. Uh, and he had, you know, tattoos all over his hands. He had a nose ring. I think he had several earrings. He had a hat on. Um, hardly someone who might be the, the sort of finance, finance uh, director of a bank, which was the point. And yet here was this guy with the report that he had 
pr photocopied at pr Kinko's and, and, and shown to all of these media folks. Uh, and he was, and, and, and in many ways, he was embodying and representing the very kind of financial transparency that doesn't exist on Wall Street. I thought, well, how awesome is this? This guy and this act of honesty and transparency juxtaposed with one another to have to actually disrupt the media audience's perceptions of what the Occupy movement is. And there's another example recently that actually I thought was more, more telling. Several uh, friends of mine, students and, and, and colleagues, who are active in the Billionaires for Bush movement, right, this sort of satiric <laughs> performance art that, uh, and I participated in this, I went to the Billionaires for Bush counter inaugural ball in 2004 in Washington, <laughs> D.C. And these are folks who show up and pretend they're billionaires and they act in this way and they talk in this way and they dress in this way as a way to provide a kind of satiric or ironic take on the sort of crony capitalism of the Bush administration. These folks have now sort of morphed into a kind of Occupy Wall Street version of this, and many of them were actually at the first General Assembly and march and protest at Occupy Harvard several weeks ago when the students decided to occupy the yard. And I was walking with them, and we were talking about Billionaires for Bush and how all of this was so interesting uh, and fun and, and, and politically important. And this guy, who was a union guy, came over and started screaming at these people who he thought were actually Wall Street people who were making fun of him. And he had lost his job, and he had lost you know, and, and his union affiliation and so forth. And they got into a very, very heated argument. And they were like, oh, we're being satirical, we're being ironic. He goes, fuck you. And it was a moment where they didn't quite get it. And I really did get what he was saying. And then later on, we were at the General Assembly, and a Guatemalan woman who works as a janitor uh, at Harvard, who is not paid above the poverty line, who was speaking in Spanish at the General Assembly and had to have a translator when she was speaking, actually turned to me because she saw similar, the same group of people doing this again at the General Assembly. And she turned to me and said, are they making fun of me? And so I think that we have to think about the way that humor is used, particularly in kinds of performances when we're thinking about the ways that different folks who may be in solidarity with one another actually perceive one another and the privilege that comes with certain forms of humor and performance. I just offer that up because I think it's important for us to, to think about those things. So humor comes with certain risks of reinforcing stereotypes and creating misunderstanding at times. And there's a tension between performance and perception, as these examples, uh, I hope, illustrate. We always need to be mindful whenever we're using humor of our own agency to use humor for political purposes and also the way that audiences may interpret or understand or misunderstand or interpret what we're doing. And yet humor is crucial for establishing common bonds. I was so interested, I was reading Saul Alinsky, rereading Saul Alinsky's <coughs> Rules for Radicals the other day, in which he has a chapter on communication. And he says that if you don't have any of the skills of organizing that I've talked to heretofore in this book, the one thing you've got to have is you've got to learn how to communicate. You've got to be able to communicate with people. Communication is about a two-way street. It's about reciprocity. You need, as a communicator, to understand the people that you're talking to and vice versa. And it's, it was interesting to me, because I hadn't remembered this uh, before this time reading it, is that this chapter is full of humor. It's full of jokes. It's full of sort of witty asides, and it's all full of anecdotes that actually bring a smile to the face. And, I was, and he doesn't actually say humor is an important tool of communication, but that's actually what he's saying in the book. And it was an interesting way of rereading it through the lens of trying to prepare here. And one of the things that I tell my students all the time <laughs> when we're studying social movements is to understand that social movements are always social as well as moving. And, and so the idea of humor as a kind of salve or uh, uh, a connective tissue is very important. Humor is also important for establishing a healthy balance in an essentially tragic world. The Greeks understood this. They thought that, the, that humor and laughter sort of energized fluids in the body that would help to create a balance in times of tragedy or times of, uh, of concern or crisis. The old uh, saying, laugh, you got to laugh to keep from crying, or that I don't even know if it's true that you use more muscles to frown than you do to smile. All of these, I think, are representations of that, that laughter, that humor, that that kind of release that comes with that and that sort of bond that you establish with others while laughing uh, is essential for maintaining a kind of health, both mental and physical, in times of crisis. And then finally, we know that humor can be immensely effective as a form of communication. I teach this in my uh, communications course at the Kennedy School all the time. Aristotle's sort of conception of pathos, right? There are three 
principal elements of rhetoric, logos, the argument, pathos, the appeal to sentiment or morals, uh, and then ethos, the establishment of character, the appeal to character. Uh, and pathos, of course, involves laughter, involves humor, and oftentimes a funny joke can punctuate a, an otherwise dry form of communication uh, that can help to elicit a kind of connection from the audience. And there's new research, actually, that suggests that when we experience emotions, when we're listening, if we experience uh, sort of tears, we cry, we're sad, we're happy, we laugh, uh, that those moments of experiencing those emotions actually help us remember what was said to trigger those emotions in a longer term capacity than anything else that doesn't elicit the same kind of emotions. So this relationship between emotions and memory is actually, there's a kind of science and, and biology of, of this as well that, that's emerging in scholarship. Let me offer a couple of definitions to ground our discussion of humor and what I mean here, three different kinds, and I'm drawing these from Carpio, but there's uh, it, it, that many people have talked about this. The first is the kind of relief theory of humor, and this is linked uh, in many ways to Freud, that we laugh to release pent-up aggression, mm -hmm. right? Gallows humor, right? When we're in the middle of a particular serious situation where things are coming down, we sort of make a joke to make light of this. Um, Freud talked about tendentious jokes, obscene or hostile jokes that allow both the joker and the audience to release energy that would otherwise be used for inhibition. Uh, and this often arises from oppression. Uh, and Carpio talks about the kind of slave humor that, is, that emerges out of slave folk tales and slave spirituals uh, as a way to uh, illustrate this. Um, one of the, 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 a gay example of this is Harvey Milk's line, hello, I'm Harvey Milk and I'm here to recruit you. Right? The Harvey Milk would frequently open up his speeches with that opening line as a way to release the tension in the room that derived from the anxiety that his mostly straight audiences much of the time in his political career would have about him as a homosexual man. There's a great moment in the, in the recent movie, Milk, uh, where he does this, and the entire room, it's a union hall, these kind of big, burly worker union guys, uh, and they laugh as a result of this. And this is a, a, a sort of form of relief humor. Then there's superior, a superiority a theory of humor. And this, I think, actually is most uh, abundantly illustrated in hip-hop culture. We laugh at other people's misfortune. Uh, the dozens, yo mama jokes, um, which privilege kind of verbal wit and dexterity over mean-spiritedness. Uh, the traditions of boasting or toasting or roasting. Uh, and hip-hop culture actually manifests this in two ways. One is the kind of breakdancing battles, where your body actually performs to establish its kind of superiority over a lesser physically uh, equipped human being. And then the MC in the rap battles where the kind of verbal dexterity and wit and braggadocio is on full display and, people, and one person is better than the other and they sort of battle it out. Um, Henry Louis Gates, my colleague, has talk, talked about this as signifying. But there's an, an interesting example of this which I'll give you um, from when Jane Lynch hosted uh, the Emmy Awards recently. And I just want to play it for you. This is an example of superiority humor. So that's a form of superiority humor. The, guy, the idea of, sort of raising one status up even though it may be subordinated to others is a way to sort of mock uh, the masculinity and the machismo of entourage. I thought that was a great moment and example of that. And then there's a third theory of humor, incongruity theory, where we laugh when our expectations are disturbed uh, or norms are inverted in some way, playing a kind of what-if game that suspends normativity, that we take time and space and circumstance and push all sorts of buttons so that humor becomes not just a coping mechanism or a means of redress, but a form of creative criticism. And I want to play a very short clip from Senator Barney Frank that illustrates what I mean here. <laughs> Armed Forces. I have a question for you about the uh, the working group that Secretary Gates put into effect. He appointed of uh, the Defense Department Working Group. They recommended that a uh, straight military personnel will have to shower with homosexual. Uh, open, uh, shower with homosexual. What do you think happened to Jim Doll of America? What do you think happened to the House of Representatives? The most didn't shower with homosexuals. What a silly issue. What, 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 what do you think goes wrong when people shower with homosexuals? Do you think it's the spray makes it catchy? I mean, people shower with homosexuals in college dormitories, in 
gyms where people play in sports, in gyms elsewhere. It is a complete non-issue. So that recommendation, you think, is, is an non-issue? I, to accept the principle that homosexuals can't shower with other people, there's a degree of discrimination that goes far beyond this. I mean, uh, we, we don't get ourselves dry clean. We, we tend to take showers when we play in sports. The notion that there's somehow anything new in the first place about showering with homosexuals. Remember, I don't ask, don't tell, by the way. <laughs> right, and he goes on talking about us on top of that moment where he says, you know, remember we don't get ourselves dry clean uh, is a moment where he's sort of flipping this and creating, uh, in the reality of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, he's creating a certain incongruity between the perception or the, the, real, the reality that this conservative Christian news reporter seems to understand and the new reality of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell has put in term, and he uses humor uh, to do that. I should say that I have my own experience with this, actually, and I know Dan Choi is here, who is a, a hero of, of many battles, but uh, this one in particular. Uh, and uh, I was, and I don't know if you had anything to do with this, Dan, but several folks um, got me an opportunity to uh, provide testimony to the comprehensive working group on the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was run by the Pentagon, a variety of other things. <clears throat> so I had this very, very good kind of two hours of testimony, these folks, a lot of questions, a lot of historical questions about sort of comparing the, the, the consequences of desegregating the armed forces racially and this and the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. A very good conversation. Towards the end of the conversation, it was a phone interview, so there were a number of people on this sort of panel and then me. And thank God I wasn't actually there in person. I was in my office because I probably would have jumped over the table. But the guy says at the end, oh, so we have one more question for you, Professor. Um, what about the showers? And I'm thinking, we just had a very, very substantive conversation. We didn't agree on everything, but I mean, this was, this was really above board. For I said, well, what about the showers? And he looks, well, I mean, it's a very serious concern. It's probably the concern for us. <laughs> And I said, look, I said, you, put, you can't see me right now, and you have, no, you have no knowledge of my life beforehand, but I was an athlete for my entire life, and I've been showering naked with other men and boys for, the rest of, for most of my life. And I said, and at the end of the day, you know, the one thing about men that we all kind of have in common is that we're obsessed with each other's dicks. <laughs> and we want to know whether we're showers or growers. And we all kind of want to know that. And so we always check each other out, no matter where we are on, this, on the spectrum of sexual orientation. And I said, so, you know, if you and I, Colonel, were in the shower together, we'd probably be checking each other out to see who's the grower and who's the shower. <laughs> and there was, like, laughter from the lawyers were laughing, and all of the military people were, like, dead silent. And I'm in my office being like, yes! You know, and think, and, and, but uh, so there it was. So, you know, using that kind of humor to kind of upend people's expectations or realities is really important. So there are lots of different forms of humor. I won't go into all of them, wit and satire and slapstick comedy, irony, sarcasm, burlesque, etc. Um, but the point here is that the cultural use of language, of humor, and performance, and the triggering of emotions can conspire to have a powerful political effect. And so let me give you some, some political examples here. And this is, I'm going to close up with these examples. The first, of course, refers back to Harvey Milk. The example that I said, my name is Harvey Milk, and I'm here to recruit you. Right? This idea of leading his speeches, often to audiences of straight people, with that kind of disarming, humorous moment. Right? He was the master of combining uh, kind of performative humor and a performative progressive politics in the interest of coalition building. So that the humor is used rhetorically as the lead of these stump speeches as a way to release and to disarm a potentially anxious or potentially oppositional kind of situation. It didn't obviously work in every way, but it worked well enough to get Harvey Milk elected on his fourth try uh, to the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. And I think it's really important here to see how humor can help to sort of engage and disarm some anxieties about homosexuality. And this idea of recruitment in the double sense. He's dealing with this in a double sense because he's tapping into the unspoken anxieties that people have over homosexuals recruiting people who are straight to become homosexuals, particularly uh, adults and children. Right? There's a tremendous anxiety, and it still exists in this current day. The right uses this kind of invocation of our harm to children all the time. Uh, and what Harvey Milk was doing was going, tapping right into that kind of ideological vein, that ideological anxiety about our sort of potential pedophilia, uh, pedophilic tendencies. And he was flipping the meaning of it to actually engage them in a recruitment effort to come to his coalition politically so that they could win and have representation on the Board of Supervisors. So he's using this term doubly through an act of humor. 
A second example that I want to sort of bring up is, is this, this sort of aesthetic of camp and the practice of drag. Uh, this is another way that queer people have used humor uh, throughout the LGBT movement for the last, you know, however many years, not just 40 years, but well beyond that. This idea of, of sort of, of gender bending, of playing with the sexual and gender norms and stereotypes as a way to intervene in the culture. And of course, one great example of this is, uh, is the village people. So I'll play that movie. I love this video. This video is super fabulous. <laughs> I love the thrusting camera. <laughs> <laughs> That. And one of the reasons I love that is because I, when I was in graduate school, some of you probably know Eliza Byer, who's the executive director at Glisten. She and I were uh, graduate colleagues together in Columbia's history department. And one, uh, one, after, one evening, uh, Ken Jackson, the famous historian of New York, brought a bunch of graduate students up to Yankee Stadium for a game and a sort of tour of the neighborhood. Uh, and, and this was the first season that the Yankees had their grounds crew come out in the seventh inning and do YMCA for the audience. And then everybody would do this in place of the seventh inning stretch. And it was the first year we did that, and it was the first time I had seen it. And Liza and I had been Yankees fans for many years. And she just turns to me, bewildered, because we're surrounded by all of these ostensibly straight people doing YMCA with great enjoyment on their face. And she turns to me, she goes, my God, do these people have any idea how far queer culture has infiltrated their lives? And I remember thinking, no, I don't think they do, actually. Um, but the village people, their sort of multicultural working class, kind of hyper-masculinity, uh, was meant to kind of upend our norms about gender and sexuality. The YMCA, of course, is a deeply Christian place, but it's also a place where they have everything and you can go to hang out with all the boys. Uh, this was a kind of form of camp, I think, a form of, 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 of camp and, and, uh, and, and a camp kind of humor. Michael Bronsky describes this camp as reclaiming the past of popular culture, often making fun of it while simultaneously using it to comment on the present. Susan Sontag, in a very famous essay in 1964, Notes on Camp, said the essence of camp is its love of the unnatural, of artifice and exaggeration. And camp is esoteric, something of a private code, a badge of identity, even among small urban cliques. And she, of course, was referring to homo homosexuals. But it's a satiric take on the normal. And one of the things that's so interesting about the village people is that they were incredibly popular among queers, but also incredibly popular among straights who weren't always getting the kinds of coded <laughs> Uh, references in humor. So it was almost a way to make fun of straight people to kind of subvert their own ideas about things without them even noticing. And drag, of course, is another way to do this. Andy Warhol said that drag queens are ambulatory archives of ideal movie star womanhood. Uh, and of course, there's a problem, I think, with thinking of drag only in that way. Um, that, that drag could be, and sometimes is, a form of, it can be liberating for many people who, who do it and many people who view it, uh, but it can also play into stereotypes and make, making fun of experiences and identities, transgender identities, transvestite, transsexual, uh, that are real and not at all actually exaggerations of any ideal form of anything, uh, but the real lives of individual people. There's another uh, way that humor has been used in queer culture, uh, and this is in the sort of the, the, the visual culture of AIDS activism. Uh, and one of my uh, students did a pretty brilliant thesis. It was actually a catalog for the ACT UP exhibition that Helen Molesworth curated at Harvard, which came to New York last year. Uh, and many of the, uh, uh, the, the visual images in that uh, in that, uh, that exhibition speak to the kind of the use of humor in a quite different way uh, as a way to make uh, very, very aggressive political points. So here you have uh, a group called Gang with no date, but it's roughly around the same time that, uh, that George Herbert Walker Bush was running for office and said, read my lips, no news taxes. And here we have <coughs> a poster with an image of a vagina saying, read my lips before they're sealed. 
reverse the Supreme Court's ban on abortion information, phone your senators and congressional representatives, and tell them to overturn the Title X gag order now. And this was a poster that, what, that obviously has uh, a, an explicit kind of radical feminist politics, but also very much using the sort of the shocking image to raise a sort of a, a different kind of humorous uh, location with respect to, to play on what George Herbert Walker Bush had done with respect to taxes. There were also Grand Fury, uh, an organization, or an activist organization, visual artists came up with their own series of, uh, of, of posters, Read My Lips, with a whole series of different configurations of same-sex couples or gender-bending couples kissing one another as a way to make a sort of a larger political point. And this too, I think, was an attempt to sort of read in humor, political humor taken from or reappropriated from the president. Uh, in order to do that. And speaking of presidents, some of the visual art from this period also uh, makes fun or mocks uh, the presidents themselves. And so here you have a, a poster of, Ron, of, 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 a, of a, um, a bullseye with a picture of Ronald Reagan kind of smiling sheepishly for the camera and says, he kills me, ha, ha, ha. But really what it's about is the fact that Reagan, of course, was silent over AIDS for most of his presidency and this kind of mocking of the humor and playing on the idea of humor, but also a very deadly uh, kind of subtext is there. You also see uh, another uh, form of this is a poster of George Herbert Walker Bush as the Marlboro Man, mm -hmm. right? Talking about the AIDS crisis, right? He's the AIDS crisis, mm -hmm. right? And this, I think, is a particularly savvy form of visual culture because here it's using the image of the Marlboro Man, right? Which is a cigarette icon, right? Which, and cigarette smoking had become largely stigmatized or was becoming stigmatized during this period of time to actually use that image as a way to intervene in and contest other stigmas around gay people, particularly gay people who had AIDS. And so it reads, I think, on multiple levels and is a quite uh, brilliant ad. And then, of course, my favorite, because I'm a recovering Catholic, uh, you have this uh, poster from Richard Deagle and Victorio, uh, Victor uh, Men Mendolia from 1989, if you can see it. It says, know your scumbags. And here is the uh, Archbishop of New York <laughs> with a, a condom uh, that is shaped roughly like the, uh, like the uh, ceremonial garb that he's, uh, that, he's, uh, that he's wearing. And underneath the condom, it says, this one prevents AIDS. <laughs> right? and, uh, and which I love for a whole variety of reasons. But one of the things here is that it has a double message, right? You have the, it's critiquing through humor the homophobia of the Catholic Church embodied in the Archbishop. But it's also critiquing the fact that the Catholic Church was opposed to contraception and any form of contraception that would have prevented pregnancy uh, or also uh, the AIDS crisis. And so it's actually giving you two, me like the, other, the others, uh, that give you kind of feminist and queer uh, uh, political messaging in the same thing. This is also attacking the Catholic Church on two dimensions, both in terms of its uh, power structure and also the policies uh, that come out of the church. And, and I, won't, I don't have time to sort of read this, but there's an amazing exchange that I often read when I'm talking about the Reagan era between a White House spokesperson uh, and a journalist about AIDS and how it, it became uh, at the early part of the crisis. It was a journalist interviewing this White House spokesman at a press conference in 1982, and the entire exchange is actually riddled with jokes from the White House spokesperson about homosexuality, about gay people, and about AIDS, where the journalist tries over and over and over again to push back and to sort of get him to move in a new direction and stop mocking this deadly crisis. And it's an amazing sort of exchange uh, that I can, I can uh, share with you uh, later on. And then uh, uh, just two last uh, quick points, other examples of sort of how humor is used. Um, this is a, a clip from, uh, I don't know if I've ever laughed this hard, actually, than when I saw this clip <coughs> from Modern Family. It's the pilot of the show. Oh, no. Everybody fawning over Lily, and then you walk on, and suddenly it's all, ooh, Sky Mall, I gotta buy a motorized tie rack. <laughs> right, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give a speech. You are not giving the speech. Why are you gonna be stuck with right. these people for the next five right, hours? You're right. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Look at that baby with those cream puffs. Okay, excuse me. Excuse me, but this baby would have grown up in a crowded orphanage if it wasn't for us cream puffs. And you know what? No, to all of you who judge. Hear this. Love knows no race, creed, or gender. And shame on you, you small-minded, ignorant few. For what? She's got the cream puffs. Oh. Okay. <laughs>
we would like to pay for everyone's headsets. <laughs> 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 so that's the pilot, of course, with Mitch and Cam, who have just adopted Lily and are flying home uh, with, the, with their adopted baby. And uh, of course, Mitchell mistakes. He's very oversensitive, and he mistakes this comment about the actual cream puffs for a kind of homophobic slur about them, gay men, being cream puffs. And I remember reading, I remember watching this for the first time and nearly peeing my pants, and I, I don't think I've ever laughed that, that, that hard. And then when I, because the, the whole idea of the, this is a sitcom, this is an enormously funny moment, but it's also a very serious one, right? The kind of anxiety that Mitchell's feeling at the time, the way that Cam is trying to get him not to make a fuss, not to speak out, right? It's also a kind of political moment, and then he realizes that the woman hadn't actually made a homophobic slur, that she was talking, but they were talking about the cute baby and the pastries, that they weren't actually talking about that. And and I thought about the way that, you know, that so the representation in pop culture of queer people and how, it, you know, this marks a signal kind of advance in the culture in many ways, that these folks didn't come out in the sitcom. They arrived already out and married and adopting a child. Uh, and they're not perfect. They're as crazy and neurotic and weird as the other couples, but they're as crazy and neurotic and weird as the other straight couples there. And the show sort of plays off that, I think, in quite brilliant ways. It's not a perfect show by any means. But when you think about the sort of the Ellen, the show Ellen, which of course was a path-breaking show and where Ellen DeGeneres actually came out during the show and in real life, sort of art imitates life, and you think of Will and Grace as a sort of intermediary kind of representation of this, and now you have Modern Family and Glee and these other shows, and one of my friends who works in Hollywood said, you can't get a show greenlit anymore in Hollywood without uh, gay characters. Um, and certainly, of course, it's not perfect, and there are all sorts of constraints on this. But I do think it's very interesting how that, that just in those three shows alone, all pathbreaking, I think, in their own ways as cultural representations to a more mainstream audience, uh, have evolved and have different kinds of representations. But I also think it's very interesting that most of the main, the successful mainstream representations of queer people in popular culture come in sitcoms, situation comedies. They don't often, by and large, come in dramas, although recently there have been uh, many, many more in, in dramas. But the comedy seems to be the place where these kinds of representations become acceptable or emerge as acceptable. And I'm not sure if that means that straight people are more comfortable with queer people through this sort of vessel of humor, if this means that we've completely sold out and become mainstream and therefore have no edge, I don't know. Um, but I think it's worth acknowledging that the sort of use of humor um, has been very crucial as a kind of vessel for presenting LGBT people to a larger, uh, a larger public. And then uh, the last point here, the last example of this is what I call politic comedy. Uh, that there are now any one of a number of comedians, right? We've always had LGBT comedians, uh, Jane Lynch and, and Kate Clinton and Ellen DeGeneres and a whole host of others. Uh, but now you see the emergence of straight comedians, straight identified comedians, who are actually articulating sort of pro-LGBT <laughs> politics, right? That you see literally every week, if not most nights, on Jon Stewart or Stephen Colbert, you see rep the use of humor to make politi to score political points against those who would oppose LGBT rights, against those who articulate a kind of homophobia in the culture. Bill Maher uh, has spent the last season actually making fun of Michelle Bachman's husband, Marcus Bachman, uh, and every show he gets in a kind of humorous dig about Marcus Bachman, alluding to the fact or explicitly stating the fact that he thinks he's a closet case, and this, of course. Is is not just because Marcus Bachman uh, may manifest certain kinds of stereotypes that some people may associate with gay men, but that Marcus Bachman runs a clinic that uses a psychological uh, methodology of trying to convert gay people to pray away the gay and convert gay people to being straight. And so this is a political point that intervenes not only in Republican politics and the politics over family and, and, and so forth, but it also intervenes in a politics that has a longer history in the LGBT movement, which is the kind of, the, the, the way that the gays and lesbians are pathologized, seen as deviant people, seen as, as worthy of, or need, in need of help, in need of conversion. And of course, this has a long and pernicious and violent history in the LGBT movement. Uh, and Bill Maher is sort of mocking this, mocking the sort of endurance of this uh, in modern politics. 
Uh, and then Chris Rock had a great line in one of his, uh, one of his uh, routines several years ago, long before uh, I think um, the marriage equality movement really hit its stride and earned the kinds of victories that it has earned recently. Um, but he said in a routine uh, shortly after actually the, the marriage ruling, the Goodrich ruling in Massachusetts, uh, he said, yeah, I'm all for gay marriage. I want gay people and lesbian people to be as fucking miserable as I am. Uh, and he made that, that comment. I'm not sure that's a politically radical comment, but it was, an, it was a striking comment when I, when I first heard it. And then, of course, there's this example, which I think is actually uh, even, more, uh, even more striking than, than any of those, which is this speech. Like Senator Adam. By Diane Savino no, in the New York Senator State Adams. Senate, the first uh, time marriage equality was being debated. This, I've spoken on this floor many times myself, and I've never been quite as nervous. Not because I'm not sure of my position, or how I feel, or what I think is the right thing to do. Because I'm not sure what's going to happen. And that's rare in the New York State Senate. You know, rarely do we know, <laughs> not know the outcome of bills before they come to the floor. And rarely have we faced an issue as important as this without knowing the outcome. Tens of thousands of New Yorkers' lives are hanging in the balance in this debate. They are either going to go home today knowing that we made history here in New York State, or they're going to go home incredibly disappointed, but certainly unbowed, and the struggle will continue. But I hope that we are going to make that history here today. I hope that we're going to take that step forward to continue the promise of Thomas Jefferson that Senator Schneiderman so eloquently talked about, or eradicate the inequality that Senator Adams described so painfully. I hope that we're going to make that choice. Because I reject, even though I have great respect for Senator Diaz, and I do, and he's not here, but I do have great respect for him, and I have great respect for his religious convictions. But this vote is not about politics. It's not about Democratic politics or Republican politics. It's not about who contributed to what campaign. It's not about who tried to make this body one party or another. It has absolutely nothing to do with this. This vote is about an issue of fairness and equality, not political. It is about the fairness of people who are of the right age, of sound mind, who choose to live together, share everything together, and want to be able to have the protections that government grants those of us who have the privilege of marriage and treat it so cavalierly in our society. That's all this is about. Whether Senator Duane and his partner Lewis, who were two of the most committed people I've ever met, I will tell you, I'm over the age of 40, and that's all you're gonna get from me. <laughs> but I've never been able to maintain a relationship of the length or the quality that Tom Duane and Lewis have. Why should they be denied the right to share their life together? I don't know Assemblyman O'Donnell's partner, but I know he is as committed to him as Tom is to Lewis, and as my friend Matt Titone is to his partner Josh. These are relationships that I envy, and in fact, we all should envy. And all they ask for is to be treated fairly and equally, and be able to plan for each other in the event something happens to them. The same way Senator Lanza does with his wife, Marcel, or Senator Flanagan does with his wife, or any of those of us here who are married are able to plan and protect the person that we love. You know, I've also been lobbied, quite interestingly on this bill, by people on both sides. I'll tell you one funny story. I was on 6th Avenue in Manhattan, I was in my car, was driving, make a left turn onto 52nd Street. I was stopped at a light, I had my window open. And a young man on a pedicab stopped and stuck his head in the window of my car, which I thought was kind of strange. But he recognized the Senate license plate on my car, and this was right during the week that the Assembly was taking up the vote earlier this year. And he said to me, excuse me, is there gonna be a gay marriage vote in Albany this week? And I said, uh, yes, the Assembly's gonna take it up, but the Senate probably won't take it up anytime soon. I'm not sure when. And he said, are you gonna vote for it? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, why? And I said, because I believe that people should be able to share their life with whoever they want, and the role of government is to administer that contract that they agree to enter into. And he stopped and he said, but they're changing the definition of marriage. And I said, I get so excited about this marriage stuff. I said, think about this. We just met, you and I, right here at the stoplight. You stuck your head in the window of my car. 
I said, do you know tomorrow we could go to City Hall, we could apply for a marriage license, and we could get married? I said, and nobody there will ask us about the quality of our relationship, or whether, whether we've been committed to each other, or any of those things. They will issue that marriage license and we can get married. And he said, yes, that's true. I said, do you think we're ready for that kind of commitment? <laughs> and he stopped and he said, I see your point. <laughs> I love that speech. <laughs> now, the reason I, I play that, and I could play clips from John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and, and Bill Maher and, and Chris Rock and all these folks who, are, who, are, who have recently begun to sort of intervene in this world of queer politics and also to use humor quite effectively for those of us who are, on behalf of those of us who are queer. And I think that this new emergence of a kind of queer political comedy, which includes a lot of straight allies, is something that we need to pay attention to, that it's, it's, it's working. It's making, I mean, I see all the time on Facebook postings of clips from Jon Stewart and Bill Maher and all of these different folks. This speech was all over Facebook when it happened. And part of the reason why I think these kinds of interventions, cultural interventions, are so important is that they use humor effectively for political purposes. They call attention to the absurdity of the other argument, the absurdity of the other side, the absurdity of the endurance of homophobia and transphobia and all of these ancient prejudices that have no place in a modern world. I've been talking a lot about public and political uses of humor, but let me end with two more private reflections. Because I think it's important for those of us who are queer and those of us who are not to understand the importance of private humor as well. That one of the things that has allowed queer people, the LGBT community, to endure through all of this, through discrimination, through violence, through mental illness, through addiction, through disease, through all sorts of misrepresentations and malignments and efforts to demean us, is because we've had the capacity to laugh, which actually springs from the kind of fountain of creativity that is so abundant and so powerful in our community. And that kind of humor, that creative criticism that is embedded in that humor is what has allowed us not only to develop the resilience we need to be in the world that we live in, but also to resist the worst parts of the world that we live in. And for much of the history of our time on this planet and in this nation, we have had to do that for ourselves. And we are now just emerging in a world where we no longer have to rely just on us, just on the laughter that we express through our pain and our suffering and our aspiration. We are now beginning to rely on other people for that. But that does not mean that when we get together, when it's family time, as Julie Davis, my dear colleague at Face Value, one of the great heroines of the movement, has said to me over time, family time, we get together and we're not angry, we're not straight hating or man hating or whatever hating, right? We laugh all the time. That is actually fundamental to the existence that we live, that is personal and social, but also deeply and always political. And so that private humor that we have enjoyed that springs from this sort of, vi this fountain of creativity, I think has been really important to us in terms of allowing us to have that resilience. And one of the things that I've learned through my study of African American history and culture and politics for, and, and my sort of experiences in African American history, culture and politics throughout my life, uh, is that black folks have this capacity for laughter as well. And the laughter is never more abundant when they're with one another away from the perniciousness of white supremacy. And I think we have that too. And it's a place that I think we can begin to construct even stronger ties of solidarity. And then the last thing is the importance of humor in our most intimate relationships. I just got married last spring in Massachusetts to my husband CJ. And you know there are a lot of things I love about him. He's gorgeous and brilliant and just and decent. But he is also so fucking funny. <laughs> and when we're at home alone, just the two of us with our dog, and we're just watching TV, or we're talking about politics, or we're cooking something, or we're talking about the crazy shit people said to us all day long, especially <laughs> when we were about to get married, all of the jokes about whether or not we were going to be monogamous from straight friends, all of those things. It's his ability to laugh and have humor and bring humor, always with an edge, into my life that actually makes me realize every single day, every single moment that I'm with him, that I'm not only in love, 
but then I'm actually much closer to liberation than I've ever been in my life. And I'm not going to get up here and say that gay marriage is the end all be all of the movement. That is not what I'm arguing at all. In fact, I've argued against it and have been uh, critiqued for being opposed to gay marriage equality, um, which of course I'm not because I have enjoyed marriage equality. Um, talk about misrepresentations. Um, but when we get to that point, it's in those moments of humor that I realize what love and liberation actually are. And I've never gotten that close when I've been in public. I've never been as close as I am when I'm with him, when I'm in those very private, intimate spaces, to a really liberated space. And so I think it's important for us to understand that humor operates on all dimensions and all levels. And at the end of the day, for us to be truly liberated, and liberation is a form of revolution, we need to be serious and funny. We need to see culture as a place for political transformation. And we need humor deeply and desperately in both public and private spaces. And so we keep fighting and we keep laughing because all of our lives, all of our lives depend on it. Thank you. Um, I'm reliving through Occupy my early days with ACT UP. I was around in 87, 88, and 89, and I remember one specific story is early on, some of the cops would wear these yellow gloves, these dishwashing gloves that would come up on their forearms, and of course somebody at some demonstration said, your gloves don't match your shoes, your, do your gloves don't match your shoes, which we started <laughs> chanting. And it was one of those things, you know, the early days, people would disappear into a hospital uh, a week later and you never see them again. And uh, there's this horrible tragedy going on, and yet that's, that's what we were doing. My question for you yeah. is about absurdism. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned to Jeff and Ryan right here earlier that you know, there's an asteroid headed towards this planet. It's going to wipe most of us out uh, eventually. You know, it's just a we're a super volcano, whatever. Mm -hmm. Extension of it, extinction event. I ultimately find <coughs> life totally absurd. Yeah. And that's why I keep laughing. Yeah. And yet, I'm involved with Occupy because as long as I'm here, I'm going to try to make a difference. Yeah. So, and that's, anyway, I'm curious philosophically what you think is Yeah, behind. yeah. I mean, I, um, I mean, that's a tough thing because I also think that the world is absurd. I think the world is totally absurd. Well, you're at Harvard. I'm at Harvard. The world, uh, believe me, that world, uh, which, which <laughs> conceives of itself as the world, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's absurd. Uh, it, it is absurd. I mean, there's, there's no way that you can look at what is happening globally and in this country right now, economically, socially, politically, militarily, and not just throw your hands up and say, what the fuck is going on? Um, and yeah, Newt Gingrich is the, you know, I mean, the front runner now, which, you know, I don't know whether to be thrilled by that or to be just like, really, we're at that place. Um, and, you know, and I think that there are folks who see that kind of absurdity, and I think it really is that, um, and develop a way to live in the world that is a kind of um, counter-representation to that absurdity, absurd in some other way, right, to, to add to the absurdity right, to sort of add to the buffet of absurdity and sort of live that life. Um, and, and, and I do that sometimes myself, notwithstanding my blazer. Uh, I do do that. And, and I certainly appreciate it when other people do it. But the point is, you know, how do we, how can we be political by engaging in that kind of counter absurdity? Uh, and the point that you make about trying to figure out as long as we're here and this is what we got, what do we do to make it not what it is? And I think that that is a question we all have to answer. And some of us check out, some of us, you know, go crazy, some of us try to create counter representations and performances within this to add to the buffet, and then others of us go right at the absurdity and try to make that change. However, we do that. I mean, some of us think it's through politics, some of us think it's by occupying public spaces, some of us think it's both, right? And I think that, you know, to be um, you know, I believe that we are always and already global citizens, and regardless of how we're denied that, or whether we're denied that, or where we're denied that, we can't accept that denial. And to be a global citizen is to act in the world that we have while we're here in order to make it better. I do 
profoundly believe that. And different circumstances and different issues call for different forms of intervention and engagement. But I do believe that, you know, we got to do that. And for some people, it, it, you know, it, it's not going to be the same thing for everybody. And I think that's fine. I think that's fine. I mean, if we're going to, this is one thing I, it drives me crazy about institutions of higher education that conceive of themselves as liberal, right? There is no word used more often at Harvard than diversity. And usually it's preceded by respect for or of students. And if that's true, then why is Harvard Yard on lockdown right now? Because there are 19 tents in the middle of Harvard Yard. In the middle of a lockdown that is more severe than any lockdown I've seen during the anti-apartheid movement, during two sprees of Gulf Wars, uh, 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 American-led Gulf Wars, uh, 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 wars. Um, you know, the living wage movement, when students actually took over the administration's building, right? Uh, no police presence like this one, right? Which suggests to me that the police, they're afraid of something. The administration's afraid of something, the police are afraid of something, and we've seen that play itself out in all sorts of different ways throughout the country. Um, but it seems to me that if you are going to respect diversity, if you're going to claim that as a kind of orientation for living, then you need, to ex you need to respect the fact that there are lots of different types of political expression, right? Even if those forms of political expression make you uncomfortable, right? Even if those representations of what it means to be queer make you uncomfortable, you have to realize that that is one representation and that maybe your way of being political or your way of representing what is queer makes that person uncomfortable. So right back at you. So let's figure out a way to create a space for everyone to express themselves that way in terms of their identity and in terms of their politics and how those two things meld together. Because that's democracy. That's freedom. And that's also equality, I believe, if we can create that space. You know, I don't think we're in any danger of achieving that anytime soon, but that is, I, that's where I feel we should be, right? And that requires a constant self-analysis and self-reflection um, that I think most of us don't do often enough. Other questions? Yeah, Elliot. Yeah, I'm wondering about your thoughts on the supposedly ostensibly political comedy of, of Stewart and whether it ends up becoming anti politics about political things. Yeah. You know, the, the idea of sublimating otherwise meaningful politics through laughter and his ridiculous <coughs> and reactionary march to restore yeah. sanity, which basically said, shh. Things are crazy, don't talk about it anymore. Let's go back to a nice, clean, liberal world where we can exist inside our desires of a, a future someday when things aren't as fucked up as they are now. Mm -hmm. And I think related to that, I'm, I'm wondering, um, humor seems to create an affect. And I, I mean that in like the imminent theory conception of the term of affect. That it's like almost like a substance that can be used. Sometimes it does its own work and sometimes it it can be kind of grasped almost. Mm -hmm. and the way that Stuart seems to grasp it is to say, we can have our laugh and, and descend into cynicism. But it can exceed his capture as, as, as well. But he's become so hegemonic. I'm wondering, am, am I wrong to see him as an enemy? Uh, I'm just pissed off at a couple of his segments in the ridiculous yeah. march. Yeah. Um, well, first, that's a lot of questions, and we're going, we're going out for beers afterwards, so I'll, uh, we'll continue the conversation. Uh, this is one of my former students uh, and dear friends. Um, the first about the march. The march to restore sanity made me fucking crazy. I absolutely hated the march. I, I went, I was there for a couple of I fell asleep at that march and then left because I was so appalled by it. Um, and because it really was this... It was meant for TV. It was this. It was. It was. It was a kind of stage performance meant for Comedy Central, uh, and for the powers that be in Washington in a way that I felt like was being already co-opted even before it happened, and to implicate all of us in it was actually retrograde and a kind of an anti-politics. As you, like all of the energy that was flowing into that march, like all the people that I went to that march with who were aggrieved and angry and had serious and substantive critiques and analysis about what was going on, that we were kind of hoodwinked into all going to Washington for this thing that was billed as this great kind of consensus building progressive thing. Uh, and then it ended up being a complete joke. And the joke was on us. And I was angry when I left that march. 
Usually I'm angry when I go to a march, and then I feel better when I leave. <laughs> I, was, I felt great going to it and was furious afterwards. And the only thing that gave me any sort of joy in the whole thing or any kind of affect during that whole, uh, the whole demonstration was all of the signs about marijuana. And I thought, oh my god, maybe there's some weed here, and I can just get really, <laughs> really high, and then it will be better. Um, and then there was no weed there, and I, I was terrible. Uh, and so I, I do, I, I agree with you that it was a kind of anti-politics, but I also think that the Beck rally pr prior to that was also the same thing. And I know a lot of very conservative people who I've talked to, and I do actually have conservative friends. Um, I have you know, family members who are in the Tea Party, proudly so. It's going to be a fabulous Christmas, let me tell you. With the, the <laughs> occupiers and the Tea Partiers literally at the same table at Christmas. Um, and, then, and then several people are waiting to be converted to either side. Uh, so it'll be great. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the thing that, I mean, what that did is it drew all these people who were angry and had grievances and so forth for, in other ways, right, and brought them all to Washington thinking that this was going to be, and then it became this kind of weird kind of watered down tent revival. Like he was a kind of 21st century Charles Grandison Finney without any of the interesting qualities that made Charles Grandison Finney so beloved and widely followed. Um, and uh, you know, it was, it, it was really weird. I remember watching it on TV. I didn't go, obviously, but that was so strange. And then there was the other march, right, the, the, the march that was supposed to be you know, the sort of march for all these different progressive causes that, and, that you went to that I couldn't go to, actually, because I was out of town, but the, um, which kind of got no attention and kind of fell flat. And, so there were all there were these kind of three things that were going on. And I think in some ways Stuart and Colbert were trying to split the difference between the kind of progressive, the, the radical, more radical and progressive march, and this weird Glenn Beck, Sarah Palin palooza, and and as a result, it ended up being nothing. And I think it's a lesson to those of us who would see a politics of the middle as the as the way to go. I've never believed that. You know, I just finished this book on Howard Zinn, and you know, I may never, you know, have tenure. I never may have job security. I may never, uh, you know, have be successful in the way that all these people want to be successful. But I'll tell you right now, if if, if I could have half the life and half the integrity that Howard Zinn had around a whole host of progressive issues for half a century, right, in insisting that the middle ground is no man's land, right, that we need to take a stand. The lines are pretty clearly drawn, and they certainly are right now. And it's a question of where we are, where we stand, and what side of history we're going to be on when the history of this era is written. And oh, it will be. And so I think that that's really important, and this sort of middle ground is, is a problem. That said, with Stewart, I don't think Stewart's an enemy. I think Stewart, at his worst, is a symptom of a larger structural structure of culture and politics that is the enemy. And then I think that there are times when he is able to escape that entrapment, that kind of co-optation. And I think he does uh, around LGBT issues a lot. I think it's very interesting that LGBT issues seem to be the place where a lot of people, we saw as in Hillary Clinton's announcement, the State Department the other day. I mean, Hillary Clinton is, you know, a, a very impressive woman in many ways. And that speech about the new kind of policy about LGBT human rights as part of their development work and their humanitarian work, I think is very interesting. Right, and then you know, but we're still, you know, th you know, uh, uh, putting drones. You know, we're still sending drones to six different countries right now. Right, we're still at war in two, formally at war in two countries. Right, we, you know, there are all sorts of retrograde, barbaric policies in terms of foreign policy with this administration um, that Hillary Clinton is central to, the central to the formation of. Uh, and so there are these interesting ways that, you know. Folks who are fully implicated in this system that is actually the, the, the enemy are able to escape from time to time to do something that's good. And I think LGBT politics has been a way for a lot of people to kind of escape from these other. I mean, I think that without question, Obama's str the strongest part of Obama's record as President of the United States has been, so sh domestically, has been a around a whole host of LGBT issues, frankly. I mean, notwithstanding marriage, notwithstanding, <laughs> obviously, the grievances that you justly have with this administration. I'm not saying it's perfect. But, you know, I mean, it's been a pretty imperfect administration. I think he's been, you know, <laughs> by and large, pretty good on LGBT issues, right? But the thing that I think is important for us as queer people and for the movement to, to understand is that we need to assess those kinds of things that we see as being positive steps in the right direction with all this other stuff. I mean, as long as we're creating video game strategies to perpetuate 
a, a deeper and broader war agenda that is now a kind of way of life in America. I, as a gay, you can give, I could be married to CJ and live in the White House, and I'm still going to be angry, right? And as long as this first black president who gave me a little bit more rights or helped oversee that is still at, at executing all of these kinds of measures, Guantanamo is still open, drones are flying, wars are perpetuated, and as long as that's happening, then you know, we, as queer people, we need to be able to bring that critique too, and we need to be the, you know, the first ones out in front about that. So is there something about it that he can speak about the LGBT issues? Because somehow it's already decided that it's such a silly issue to, to even fight about. But the well, other it's already decided in some ways. And I think that what, what Stuart is doing I don't want to spend the whole time talking about Stuart, but I think he is he's clearly a very important cultural influence and certainly in the realm of humor, which I was discussing, he absolutely is. I do think that there has been a way, and I think you know how we assess this is important, but there is a way that, that Stuart, because he's so popular and has such a wide range of viewers, has been able to um, sort of disseminate a kind of pro-LGBT politics to a much broader range of people and get them to have their first serious consideration of these issues through the lens of laughter, which offers a form of release that then allows them potentially to have a way to enter into a more serious political space or a different kind of political space. And I think he's done that. I mean, I, I you know, anecdotally have friends of mine who have changed their views about things or certainly deepened their consideration about a range of things on LGBT issues because they have watched Stuart and Colbert and Bill Maher and these other, for Rachel Maddow and other people, just eviscerate the right on a whole range of absurdities that they continue to kind of pander and trade in. And, and so in that sense, I think he's very important politically for those issues, um, but, uh, but it's far from perfect, and that march was an example, the most egregious example of that. Other questions? I have another. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. Yeah, yeah, uh, <clears throat> I wrote it down so I can remember it. Uh, so your, uh, earlier in your lecture, you had an example about the billionaires for Bush. Uh, there was also some comedians at Occupy Wall Street that did Occupy Occupy Wall Street uh, <clears throat> that I thought was brilliant. Um, and I'm just curious what your opinion would be, like how much of a responsibility does an artist have in, a, in some, doing some satirical work like that? Um, like how does one navigate and the balance between what's working in the performance uh, versus like pissing off the people that are on your side and like because like I'll, I'll I've done some performances during Occupy Wall Street where I'll get three really great engaged responses that I'm like ah it's working and then I'll have one that I'm like ah I just pissed off someone I didn't want to piss off but I'm just gonna roll with it because I feel like it's working anyway I think it depends on what you want out of the performance I mean I think ultimately it's about if you don't want to piss anyone off you know, and artists and activists are always going to piss people off. If you're not pissing someone off, you're not living. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, I don't think. And, and that includes people within the community. I pissed off a, a, a wide range of LGBT folks, right? And I, I know that, and I'm fine, you know? I'm, I, and I, the people I pissed off, for the most part, are people I'm happy to piss off. Um, and uh, <laughs> frankly, and, and you know, bring it on. And, and I'm, but I also, these are family battles, right? L much love for you. Like, we, we don't agree on these things, but that's okay. We can, let's have a conversation because we do have something in common that we can work from, right? We already have that kind of common ground in some way, at least I, from the basis of identity, so we can move on that. Um, what, you know, so it depends on what you, you want out of that. I think there, it does, though, enter into difficult territory, and this is what I was speaking to when I told you about those anecdotes, um, is, I mean, the, the, the pain and the anger that was in the, sort of eyes and voice of the two folks that I mentioned who responded very negatively to that kind of performance politics um, was real pain and real anger. And it was real pain and real anger that came from a place of, of non-privilege that, in, at least in my reading of the situation, was seeing these folks who were engaged in this kind of performance art as being, um, as demeaning their pain and their suffering and their anger. 
And I think that if this is a movement, the Occupy movement is lots of things, and it's been criticized for that. I'm not one of those critics. But the, it's lots of things. But at the end of the day, it's got to be, first and foremost, about the least among us in terms of economic resources, material, livelihoods, opportunity, and so forth, right? If this is about, I mean, it's obviously it's about the 99%. I think it's a brilliant framing. But at the end of the day, it's got to be about the bottom 20%, the folk, the newly poor, the working poor, the 40% of black and brown children who grow up in poverty, not, not even like maybe potentially someday working class, but in poverty. We got nearly half of black and brown children, the next generation of black and brown citizens who are growing up in poverty. And if we're not principally attuned to that suffering, and that inequality, and that poverty, and that anger, and that sadness and suffering, then we need to recalibrate, right? We got to be about that, right? That I, in my opinion, that, you know, we have a lot of people at the top and on the next rung up from us that look down and talk down. For those of us who understand that that kind of hierarchy and inequality is morally reprehensible, we need to reach down. And that has to be our principal kind of valence and political orientation in this movement, if this is going to be a movement where the ladder goes up for everybody, right? And, and, I, and I think it can be. I think this is the first moment in my life and that I've studied in American history where you have a real groundswell that is genuinely democratic and grassroots, but also, you know, lots of powerful folks and privileged folks involved in this too, who are actually waging a kind of battle that is being led by a critique of capitalism. A critique of capitalism in America, where everyone's a capitalist. We're all consumers. 92% of us in 2000 thought we were middle class because we had a cell phone. <laughs> Can't pay our bills, but we got a cell phone. That Apple store today, are you kidding me? And I'm guilty of it. I went right in there and bought my power charger. <laughs> Right? And I'm not, I'm not above critiquing myself in all of this, but I think that we have to, this movement, if it's going to be transformative or revolutionary or liberating or radical in any way, it's got to be mindful of that. But I also think there are moments to stop and say, oh, I did not mean to offend you. Let's talk about the satire and let's talk about your suffering and let's talk about how those things are related. We're at the same rally. Let's walk arm in arm. Let's talk about where we're positioned in this and why we're both here. I think there's an opportunity for that in the movement if indeed those conversations happen. And while we're marching, while we're occupying, while we're camping out, while we're in the human mic, let's have those conversations. I think this is, a, this is an opportunity. Occupy has created an opportunity for those kinds of conversations to happen and for these kinds of distinctions, at least within this movement, to potentially go away. I'm hopeful about that. Okay. Yeah, one last question. I just wanted yeah. to get you to speak to something on that, on that note because mm -hmm. um, I was really glad you brought up those examples of those negative reactions you saw because I, I, I have very particular tastes in, in uh, irony. And, um, <laughs> and there's, uh, <laughs> and there's, uh, there's a great Kurt uh, Vonnegut quote where he says, uh, you have to be careful the things you pretend to be because eventually you become those things. Yeah. And I think you saw the negative side of, of that. But then I was really blown away because what I realized when you presented the YMCA thing was that that was the inverse. Mm -hmm. They pretended to be these macho stereotypes right. and they actually became them because then at a certain point they were being worshipped at a baseball game yeah. as macho stereotypes. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I feel like maybe there was some positive subver subversive element to what they did. But does that not mean that what they did was actually made, uh, made them themselves more acceptable? And does it mean that if we're pretending to be billionaires and, and making fun of this crony capitalism, making it funny, are we just making that acceptable? Mm -hmm. Like, do you think that's part of the, the risk? Not just that people get upset by it, but that we actually, like, de-vilify this thing that, for instance, Occupy Wall Street has started to really vilify again. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. That's a, that's a very profound question. I'm not sure I have a, 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 anything close to a profound answer. Um, I think that it is always, um, you know, and the, the Richard Pryor, David Chappelle examples speak to this. Um, there's always the possibility 
when you're engaging, whatever you're doing, whether you're, you're advancing a, a very serious kind of political critique or you're spoofing or, or satirizing uh, uh, a kind of political crisis, uh, regardless of the vessel through which these critiques are, are brought. Uh, there's always the possibility that it's going to get co-opted. There's no question about this. I was just at a Giants, and this is, you know, so good irony. I was just at a Giants-Patriots game. One of my students, her mother, inherited the Giants. So she owns the Giants and will probably be the CEO of the Giants at some point. She's in my class. I've never been to a professional football game. I grew up in New York, loved the Giants, live in Boston, pretend to love the Patriots. Went to this game with a colleague of mine, friend of mine from college, who's an African-American woman. Um, and who's, you know, has done a lot of hip hop work and community activism. The two of us went in these fancy seats and we're sitting there an hour before the game and all the songs, it was all hip hop, all hip hop, every song. And she's, she just turned to me, she's like, this is the shit we listened to to like get angry, <laughs> like back in the day. And now like they're warming up to this. Like, and we're sitting in box seats eating shrimp cocktail at a football <laughs> game. And I'm like, yeah, but I got a $2 beer. Uh, or what should be a $2 beer. And, you know, I think there's always the possibility that these kinds of things are going to get co-opted, particularly in a culture that is overwhelmingly capitalistic and consumer-oriented, right, where we're all consumers. Very few of us are producers anymore, right? And so that culture becomes another site of consumption, and performance becomes another site of consumption, and politics becomes another site of consumption. Um, and I think that that's always a possibility. And I'm not sure that it's possible anymore, frankly, to avoid that entirely. I'd like to know and have a political impact in a way that's kind of measurable or tangible. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't even have any metrics for how we would do that. But, you know, I mean, when I engage in politics, I get in, in, in arguments sometimes with my anarchist friends and some of my, Howard Zinn and I had these arguments. You know, I, I worked in the Obama campaign, but I'm the first one out there protesting Obama, right? Like, and I, I go in and out, and that's, you know, there's a tension there, and I understand that, but I also embrace it because I am someone who, I know that my level of frustration, if I were always, always, and everywhere on the margins and doing my thing and having integrity and not selling out and not being co-opted and not being pressured to speak this way or that way or code switch depending on which context I'm in, um, that I would be so frustrated by the fact that I had no impact at all that I've, you know, moved sometimes to places like Harvard where I can speak and have a kind of impact. Um, and I don't apologize for that, but I also understand very clearly what the stakes are in that kind of decision. Um, and, and, and we all have to sort of make them. But I think you're right that these, all of these forms are co-opted or co-optable in some way, um, which, you know, and I think we need to fight against that inevitability or eventuality as a way to maintain hope that our politics has some kind of integrity. But I think we have to ask ourselves which we would prefer do we want our politics to have integrity or do we want our politics to have influence? And am I even framing that in the right way? Is it an either or decision? Can we have both? I'd like to believe we can. I'm not sure that that's possible, but I leave that perhaps as the final kind of provocation. But thanks for your question. It's a great, great one. Thanks, everybody.